Hello and welcome to History Respond. I'm your host Bob Whitaker. On today's episode we'll be considering Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, developed by Treyarch and Raven Software. Cold War is set in 1981 and follows an American Black Ops team as they track down a rogue Soviet agent named Perseus. The game's plot weaves together real-life events, such as the Iran hostage crisis, with fantastical alternate history elements, including an American attack on the KGB headquarters in Moscow. To help me separate Cold War fact from fiction, I've invited back onto the show Dr. Chris Dietrich and Dr. Joseph Parrott, who were guests on our previous episode covering Black Ops 1 and 2 in 2016. Dr. Chris Dietrich is Associate Professor of History and Director of American Studies at Fordham University. He's the author of Oil Revolution and the editor of the two-volume Wiley Blackwell Companion to U.S. Foreign Relations, Colonial Era to the Present. Chris, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Bob. Happy to be here. Dr. Joseph Parrott is Assistant Professor of American Diplomatic and Transnational History at Ohio State University. His current research project considers Portuguese decolonization in Africa as a component in transforming Western engagement in the global South. Joe, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having us, Bob. So gentlemen, this game picks up with the Cold War in 1981. Can you give our listeners a sense of where things stood in the Cold War at this point? We know now that the Cold War was nearing its conclusion in 1981, but did it feel that way at the time? Yeah, uh, so I don't think it felt like that at all uh, at uh, at the time. Uh, in fact, we need to remember uh, that 1981, the year, uh, occurs after that long decade that historians have described as an age of fracture uh, in the 19 in the 1970s, um, and that fracture is both domestic uh, and international. Uh, this is the decade in which the United States. Uh, loses the Vietnam War. Uh, more than 58,000 Americans and between 1.5 and 2 million Vietnamese uh, had died. Civilian deaths in Cambodia and Laos numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, you have an energy crisis uh, in the United States. You have runaway of inflation uh, that's associated with a trade deficit uh, and military, uh, military spending. Um, you have uh, a stagnant economy uh, represented uh, by high levels of unemployment uh, and um, low wages, uh, you know, the famous uh, stagflation uh, that people uh, that people talk about. Uh, and in 1979, uh, you have these major uh, foreign policy crises uh, that rock the Carter administration, uh, uh, the revolution in Iran and the Iran hostage crisis, uh, and of course, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, so um, the Cold War and international relations for the United States in general uh, seem to be on pretty shaky, uh, shaky ground uh, at this point. Wow, it sounds almost as bad as 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost, uh, almost. <laughs> Although none of us really lived through it, so what? You know, what? What do we know? <laughs> yeah, and I, I think one of the things that's interesting, and the game kind of picks this up, is it? It, it did feel, I think, in, in 1980, 1981, especially for the Reagan administration, like the world was kind of aligning against the United States. And, and one of the, the things that I like to think of is if you ever go to the Reagan library, there's the room of what I like to call big scary threats. And, and you walk into this room and it's pictures of Brezhnev and the Ayatollah Khomeini from Iran, Manuel Noriega, and they're big and they're looking down at you and there's scary music playing and they're, they're kind of images of of Soviet missiles being paraded through Moscow. And, and this is very much what I think the world felt like, especially to the Reagan administration. The game really, really picks up on this. And I think it actually collapses the distance in, in an artificial way, but, but in a way that captures the, the era between the kind of threat of the USSR, this, you know, this state, um, very powerful military state on the one hand, and uh, Iran, on the other hand, which are in no way actually in cahoots, right? They're very different, this this threat of kind of state military nuclear destruction and this seeming threat of terrorism. But at the time, they felt very much kind of um, linked together in, in showing the limitations of uh, American power. And I think that's something that the game kind of captures. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the first mission of the game has you tracking down people who are involved in planning the Iran hostage crisis. And the insinuation is that this Perseus figure that you're tracking down 
has helped to goad on the Iranians to actually take these hostages. Yeah, which is, I mean, which is hilarious because, I mean, Khomeini or Khomeini as as this leader of of this kind of radical or, or fundamentalist Islamic movement saw both the United States and the USSR as imperial powers. And, and one of the reasons why we actually get the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union is because it's concerned about the spread of this kind of radical Islamic idea from Iran into Afghanistan. So they're not in any way linked, right? These, these aren't two enemies of the United States who are working together by any means. Um, but at the same time, I, I think a lot of Americans didn't really separate those two threats in their mind. And you kind of see that in infecting the way that the game presents these, these two ideas. Yeah, and that's absolutely part of, of, you know, Cold War national security from the beginning. I mean, one of the basic uh, arguments of, uh, about Cold War national security uh, is that the Soviet Union uh, is filled with adventurists mm -hmm. uh, and they'll try to take advantage uh, of any uh, instability anywhere to, uh, to make gains um, uh, in, their, in their power. Uh, so it actually, you know, it follows the logic, the longer running logic of the Cold War uh, to interpret events in the Middle East uh, through, uh, through that lens um, uh, of instability uh, and instability being a threat uh, to American power. Uh, and the Carter administration tried to respond to that, uh, as, did, uh, as did the Reagan administration, uh, through the buildup uh, of greater American, American power, um, through military buildups and through, uh, of course, covert, uh, covert operations. As somebody who's unfamiliar with this topic, it reminds me a lot of the axis of evil uh, mm -hmm. from the early 2000s, combining these varied threats and using that as an excuse for foreign adventures by the United States. Well, and, and if I could, add, I mean, even more than that, I mean, I think it's a tendency that we have when talking about American national security to combine threats and make instability seem planned and threatening and thereby something we can respond to. And I mean, we saw the same thing, not just the axis of evil, which was a nice way of tying these very different ideas together, like you point out, but when we talked about Islamo-fascism or something like that, which is very much a way to tie this very diffuse threat of, you know, terrorism together with ideas of Nazi Germany or, or something like that, right? It's a way for us to kind of make this threat seem more achievable and therefore more fightable, I guess. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder why the game developers win in this direction, but I wonder if it's kind of a artifact of creating a compelling fiction, right? To centralize all of this evil, you know, related to, in the game, one person, right? And kind of making it, uh, like you said, a planned conspiracy against the United States. Yeah, well, and I do think that the Carter administration uh, and the Reagan administration were deeply worried about the security of the Persian Gulf. We do have to remember uh, that um, they're coming off of an era in the 1970s that was marked uh, by the so-called uh, energy crisis um, or the oil shocks, uh, right? So this sense of vulnerability, um, uh, economic vulnerability, and therefore political vulnerability uh, was, very, was very real. Uh, add to that uh, Watergate uh, and a lack of faith uh, in American institutions that emerges uh, in large part out of Vietnam, uh, and you do have uh, sort of a desire among Americans in the period uh, to have a return to normalcy, a return, a return to stability uh, in that uh, in that period. And Reagan plays on that uh, in the presidential campaign uh, in 1979 and 1980. Um, I, I was at the William Casey Papers um, at uh, at Stanford uh, a couple of summers ago, and Casey ran Reagan's campaign. Uh, and one of their main uh, campaign points was just to hit Carter again and again uh, for being sort of a bleeding heart, uh, compassionate, uh, you know, uh, diplomat, uh, or uh, alternatively, a chicken hawk who sort of wanted to stand up and, uh, and you know, brussel his feathers uh, at, uh, at the Soviet Union, but didn't really do anything mm -hmm. about it, um, which isn't true. There's actually a remarkable degree of continuity uh, in between the Carter administration uh, in the late 70s and uh, and Reagan's policies in the early uh, in the early 80s, but it was a very successful campaign uh, program. Um, it, it worked. It worked quite well. Hmm. Uh, so a major plot point in this game involves America losing control of a nuclear weapon that's stationed in Vietnam. And I'm wondering, to what extent was it the case that the Americans considered using nuclear weapons in Vietnam? 
So, so I'll jump in and that, and, and I'll, I'll preface it by saying I'm, I'm not at all um, an expert on this, but from what I saw, from what the game was presenting, they actually did a fairly good job of capturing elements of an incident and then kind of exaggerating it for the, the purposes of the story. Um, and the idea is essentially that that, um, that codename Fracture Jaw thing that they had going on there was actually a, a real plan that did involve getting nuclear weapons into Vietnam as a way of winning the war when it seemed to be going against the United States in the late, late 1960s. And it was something that the generals did uh, of their own accord. It wasn't something ordered by the White House. But before the nukes could actually get deployed to Vietnam, um, you know, folks caught wind of this. This would have to be approved by the president eventually. And a, a number of staffers within the White House essentially nixed this idea and never let it get to the table of Lyndon Johnson because they didn't want him to be forced to have to choose between essentially winning the war and escalating it to the point where we'd be using nuclear weapons almost on the border with China, right? So, so this is something that was based in fact. It is something that showed there were these kind of generals operating somewhat independently of the president, though he never got a chance to really intervene. Um, but once again, it's a little bit exaggerated, but it does show you that, you know, when the United States is kind of pushed in the corner like it was in Vietnam in 1967, 1968, that there were these ideas of floating seemingly, you know, um, catastrophic or, or at least um, very dangerous ideas. And, and it went all the way from covert operations to, you know, up the ladder to using nuclear weapons mm -hmm. in a tactical way on a battlefield, which of course the United States has, has never done before or never done since, you know, 1945. Yeah. I I, I thought that part was interesting as well. Uh, I think it might reflect uh, current day concerns about technology transfer uh, and uh, the possibility of so-called rogue states uh, gaining nuclear capabilities. Um, you know, I, I think this might be as much about uh, Korea or Iran uh, today as it as it was about the United States and Vietnam uh, in the late uh, in the late 1960s. Uh, it's worth stating, though, that um, you know nuclear war was a major uh, hot button issue in foreign policy uh, in the 1970s, moving into the 19 uh, into the 1980s. Uh, Reagan wasn't an expert, uh, you know, on throw weight or anything like that. He didn't care <laughs> uh, care that much for those uh, for those details. Uh, but we do know uh, that he really did detest uh, nuclear uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and that there are a few events uh, in uh, 1982 and 1983 uh, that really drove home to uh, him, you know, sort of the possibilities of Armageddon uh, and uh, escalated his fear of nuclear, nuclear war. Uh, there's a famous television movie, uh, The Day After, uh, that shows these horrifying, uh, horrifying events that, um, uh, that was screened in the White House uh, and af affected him. Uh, there are also um, uh, a couple of sort of nuclear uh, tactical programs, uh, Abel Archer, uh, and then uh, the single integrated operational plan, PSYOP, uh, that, uh, that really sort of uh, made him think about uh, this. Uh, I guess the mechanics of the decision making for PSYOP uh, in the case of the nuclear crisis g uh, gave the president uh, six minutes uh, to make a decision uh, about whether or not uh, to, um, you know, to, push, uh, to push the button, or as Reagan put it, to unleash Armageddon. Uh, and he couldn't believe that uh, that he would have to make that kind of decision in six minutes. He just thought it was really irrational. Uh, so uh, this is a, a major a major concern at the time, and there's 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 a reason why you have these huge efforts uh, to limit uh, the expansion of nuclear weapons um, uh, through summit diplomacy uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s. Mr. President, sir. Mr. President. Mr. President, this is Jason Hudson and Russell Adams. I know their names. Who do you think approved their last mission? Is the threat real? Yes, sir, we believe it is. Can you stop Perseus? We can, sir. I've already submitted the requisition for my team. Sir, their requests are highly irregular, most likely illegal. If the press gets a hold... What the hell are you talking about? You know who we are? Every mission we go on is illegal. Sergeant Woods, 
plausible deniability is the backbone of our work. Al, we're talking about preventing an attack on the free men and women of the world. Give Mr. Adler whatever he wants. Gentlemen, you've been given an important task. Protecting our very way of life from a great evil. There is no higher duty. There is no higher honor. And while few people will know of your struggles, rest assured, the entire free world will benefit. I know you won't fail us. So speaking of Ronald Reagan, this game has generated a lot of controversy for what is seen as a sympathetic depiction of Reagan and American covert action more generally during this time period. And in many ways, this depiction is part and parcel of the kind of sympathetic portrayal of American covert action that we've all seen in Black Ops 1 and Black Ops 2. And I'm wondering, to what extent have historians dealt with these topics? And in particular, is there any sort of consensus that's emerged on how historians view Reagan and American actions at the end of the Cold War. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll jump in on the the second part of the question uh, about Reagan and the actions at the end of the Cold War. And Chris, you can you can supplement it. But I, I would say there's not really a consensus just yet. I mean, we're just getting into some of the really serious scholarship on Reagan. We're still pulling a lot of our information from memoirs from impressions, from, I think, borderline myths that have grown up uh, around Reagan at the time. And then we've had some first draft histories that I think really shaped the way we view the presidency, but have been written at, at the kind of broad, you know, 30,000 foot lens and, and, and bring their own issues to bear. But, but the one thing I would say is there's this general perspective of Reagan as this cold warrior who ramped up the conflict in the early 1980s using, among other things, covert action, yes, um, and also this more confident use of American power. And then we get this shift uh, after Gorbachev comes to power. He was pivotal in, Reagan was pivotal in um, accepting overtures about arms reduction and about pursuing these and promoting reform and pushing Gorbachev and really taking this opportunity for, for peace seriously. And so I think there's still disagreements that tend to exist about how much credit Reagan should deserve for kind of accepting and pushing this peace. Um, but also how much blame we should give him in the early 1980s for really making the situation more dangerous. And these are some of the debates that I think are still going on among historians. And then there's also debate. I mean, I, I think what Chris said is that traditional narrative, right, that, that there's that kind of Reagan shift around 1983 where he's responding to events. But one of our own colleagues from, from UT Austin, who's, who's now at Duke, Simon Miles, just wrote a book saying there wasn't as much of a shift, that, it was, that he always had this kind of grand strategic vision of peace through strength. So I think we're actually still getting into the heart of these debates uh, about Reagan. So I don't know if there's a, a full consensus yet, though we do have this kind of familiar narrative um, about the shift that Reagan undergoes and about his embracing um, negotiations and peace. Yeah, I, I would agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. And I would just add that uh, Reagan had a long career uh, before he was uh, was president, uh, in which he established himself as a stalwart, uh, cold uh, cold warrior, uh, and he was you know really well known for his ideological purity uh, regarding uh, regarding the Cold War, regarding his support uh, for capitalism and private uh, private enterprise, uh, and I do think that um, you know there is sort of a celebratory vision of him uh, and being able to uh, using using that uh, reputation, uh, being able to both be tough, uh, but also flexible. Um, I, I do think too, um, the other thing I would add in the 1980s is that you have uh, sort of the beginning of, the, of our modern era of globalization. Uh, and the Reagan administration itself uh, is very capable in taking advantage of that um, and using, uh, using uh, sort of the United States technological uh, wherewithal um, uh, to sort of recover um, uh, American, American power uh, from that, uh, that low point in the, 19, in the 1970s. Um, I, I do think too that the Reagan administration uh, made uh, an important shift uh, towards democracy promotion uh, and support for human rights um, uh, in, the 19, in the 1980s. Um, you know, the consequences of that were, are, we're still debating. Uh, we're still debating though. Uh, 
uh, um, the Reagan administration also supported authoritarian regimes um, whole uh, wholeheartedly, uh, right? Especially in uh, in Latin in Latin America. Uh, so it's it's a complicated uh, it's a complicated story. Uh, I would say that um, Jill mentioned Gorbachev. Uh, um, I think when we think about the Cold War, we need to think about him as the major uh, the major player uh, there. Uh, we also need to understand uh, that um, those policies and and uh, Gorbachev's uh, sort of view of view of the world um, arrived at its culmination after Reagan left office. Mm. Um, uh, the Cold War ended uh, ended under Bush uh, in large in large part uh, because of internal dynamics in Eastern uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, the work of European uh, uh, diplomats. Uh, and states people like Helmut Kohl or Francois Francois Mitterrand. Uh, so to make it an entirely U.S. story, I think really misses, uh, um, uh, you know, it misses the mark uh, for the end of the Cold for the yeah. end of the Cold War. Well, speaking of Gorbachev, there's a, a brief section in the game where you go on this fantastical mission to basically raid KGB headquarters in Moscow. And before you get to that point, you're playing as a Soviet double agent who actually has a meeting. Uh, with Gorbachev, and Gorbachev's in this meeting, worried about uh, American infiltrators uh, in the KGB, in the Soviet Union, and worried about kind of American pressure on the early part of uh, Reagan's administration on the Soviet Union. Um, but, you know, I think that kind of nuanced argument that you just gave us, Chris, about Gorbachev's role in the Soviet Union and in the Cold War more generally is one that uh, maybe wouldn't fit in the confines of uh, this kind of fantastical alternate history setting. Comrade Belikov, a receipt. General Secretary Brezhnev has taken an interest in the new security development. There's a mole within the KGB. The committee wants someone from the first chief directorate to oversee Colonel Kravchenko's investigation. <coughs> if you've not met him already, this is Imran Zakayev. Thank you, Secretary Gorbachev. Yeah, I don't think we should be, I think we should be hesitant, hesitant to be too triumphalist uh, in assigning uh, a victory in the Cold War uh, to actions of the Reagan administration to pressure the Soviet Union uh, um, in any way. Certainly they, they expected to do that, and they and they did uh, they did do that, uh, but I don't think that there's uh, any conclusive evidence at all uh, that you know the, you know Reagan by building up uh, arms uh, arms production and you know trying to outspend the Soviet Union uh, is what led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think that's way too uh, linear uh, and simple of a narrative uh, for the for the period. Absolutely, Bob. Yeah, and I, I would agree with Chris. I mean, that, that Gorbachev appearance was very much a cameo and had no reflection <laughs> on, on anything he did, though. I guess it was it was nice to see a young, slim Gorbachev. Um, but, but yeah, no, I mean, I think Chris is right. I, I think one of the things that Reagan should be noted for isn't necessarily the peace through the strength or the economic challenge, which I very much think was almost reread onto the history to, to help the United States claim a bigger role. But, but more that, that Reagan was the one willing to work with Gorbachev, who was a true reformer, who was pushing through a lot of these things. And so where, where I think Reagan's role is really important is the fact that he actually bucked his party and to some extent bucked his own image that he had sold to the United States at various points throughout his career of the Cold Warrior and was willing to work with Gorbachev when he came to the table sincerely rather than distrusting him or, or thinking this was some kind of ploy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's that's one. I think if there's any consensus about Reagan in the end of the Cold War, that's it. That, that he was willing to embrace uh, Gorbachev as much as he could and allow him to kind of consolidate power and encourage him to pursue these reforms domestically. Mm. Well, with reference to Reagan's public memory, um, my next question kind of relates to the criticism uh, that I've seen in the game press related to this game. And I get the sense from reading this criticism that Reagan's involvement with promoting, uh, to some extent, covert action overseas is something that comes as a bit of a surprise to Americans, uh, in particular uh, with relation to the Iran-Contra affair. And I'm wondering to what extent do you feel that the public narrative or public memory regarding Reagan misses out on these elements of his presidency, or conversely, if you feel like the public memory is uh, pretty accurate in this regard? 
So maybe I'll, I'll jump in first and I'll, I'll actually give a plug to the last time we, we did an interview together because I thought, I thought this was kind of funny. I mean, I don't know that Reagan was going around ordering the invasion of KGB headquarters like, <laughs> like happens here. And you're right, that was a kind of like zany moment in the game. Um, but, but he was absolutely involved in funneling money and weapons and training to overseas groups, sometimes covertly, sometimes a little bit more overtly. And the game we discussed last time was, was actually a, a number one example of this, right? You, you were there fighting alongside Jonas Savimbi in Angola. And these weapons that were sent there were done, you know, somewhat covertly. Certainly the stuff that was sent to Afghanistan was somewhat secretive. Though Charlie Wilson's war shows that that wasn't too secretive. Um, but, you know, that where was, where was the outrage there? I mean, I mean, Reagan actually met with Jonas Savimbi in the White House. Um, he actually met with Taliban fighters in the White House, right? And so the, the, the connection, I think, was really there for, for Reagan to be involved. That was the Reagan doctrine, after all, that was supporting these these anti-communist groups, um, and and so I think I mean I think yeah obviously Reagan was in was involved in covert relations and we'll probably talk about Iran Contra in a minute, um, but sometimes I, I wonder if the outrage that's happening now isn't just either a building outrage against this kind of very militaristic um, you know game that we're putting back in history now, or to some extent just a, a kind of you know response to the, the times that we're living in now where people want to get outrage where we're sensitive to abuses of power or the president doing things we don't expect the president to do. And, and we're kind of now, you know, casting that back on Reagan because, you know, that's the, the attitude that we have nowadays. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think that our understanding of history in the Reagan administration uh, is really, you know, just beginning. It's embryonic in a, in a sense. Um, uh, so many people that are still alive today lived through it, so they have a memory of uh, of Iran Contra, uh, for uh, for example. So I don't think that 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 part of the general public is that shocked about it, uh, but I do think that they follow along uh, the lines of what they believed at the time, uh, right? I think if you talk to uh, sort of ex ex Marines who are uh, in their seventies uh, in their seventies right now. Uh, I think they're fairly respectful of uh, Oliver North uh, and his refusal uh, to uh, sort of um, name name names and uh, and to sort of bite uh, bite the bullet and take the take the consequences. Uh, so I, I think it really depends on what sector uh, of the public uh, of the public you're talking about. Uh, I think there's a broader trajectory here of sort of public knowledge of covert. Uh, uh, covert activities that we need to draw out. Uh, we need to remember that um, the 1970s, again, uh, is the era of the Pentagon Papers. Um, it's the era of uh, congressional uh, inquiries uh, into the CIA family jewels, uh, the famous the famous Church Committee. Um, you know, this is, uh, there was sort of like a delinquency of oversight uh, that people perceived in the 1970s about the previous era, uh, you know, the, you know, the early Cold War from 1946, 1947 or so uh, until the 1960s. And you have all this uh, new information uh, coming out, uh, right? Uh, the overthrow of democrat democratically elected leaders in Iran and Guatemala, plots to kill Castro, plots to kill Patrice Lumumba, uh, the imprisonment of Soviet, uh, of Soviet defectors, uh, damaging policies in Laos, Chile, Indonesia, you name it, right? Uh, so you have all of that occurring in the 1970s, and then you have this new over, oversight, uh, these new oversight mechanisms uh, in Congress. Uh, and then uh, there's a sense that uh, the Reagan administration uh, just finds a way to work around those. Um, uh, and then you have the bombshell of, uh, of, Iran, uh, of Iran Contra. Uh, so uh, there's a back and forth uh, here um, about what the public actually actually knows and understands. Uh, and I think that many players in, in, of, of the game and people who read video game literature uh, probably don't know that, uh, know that history that well, and, and they might have been surprised uh, by, uh, by this. Uh, so you get these sort of passionate uh, uh, you know, moral, moral responses uh, to it that are um, you know, taken out of the context uh, of, uh, of, of the history. Uh, and Joe is right. Uh, the Reagan administration, like every administration before it, uh, did not want to take covert action uh, off, uh, off the table. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, during the campaign uh, for the presidency in, in 1980, uh, Reagan criticizes Carter uh, for um, you know, making a statements and supporting some of these, uh, these congressional bills uh, for oversight. But at the same time, 
Uh, Carter is uh, funneling uh, funneling funds uh, to uh, Mujahideen, the Mujahideen Afghanistan. Uh, they're working on, uh, on training uh, and arms sales programs uh, uh, to Pakistan uh, that are somewhat covert and somewhat in the in the public uh, in the public eye. Uh, so there's definitely uh, a precedent um, and a longer a longer history here of both. Uh, diplomacy uh, and covert action, but also of the politics mm -hmm. of uh, the public politics of covert of covert action. And, and maybe I'll just add, I mean, we, we keep referencing uh, Iran Contra and, and the scandal that existed there. And the scandal wasn't necessarily that there were covert actions being taken. It was that Congress finally intervene, intervened to stop the covert funding of the San, I mean, the, the Contras who were working against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. And then the Reagan administration went around Congress to continue doing that by essentially selling arms illegally to Iran and then using those proceeds to, to fund the Contras. And so that was the, the real problem. Is It wasn't that there was covert operations happening. It was that covert operations happened around the direct intervention of Congress that was trying to stop it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the other things that's important to, to mention there is, as Chris mentioned, Dolly North, I think maybe one of the things that the game is capturing is it's making it too easy to connect Reagan to these covert operations. Because in real life, Reagan very much insulated himself from mm -hmm. this, even though he was supporting this. Um, the Iran-Contra thing kind of revealed that, you know, it was very hard to tie Reagan into it. He would say general things, and then someone like Ali North would kind of run with it. And so when we look back at that period, we don't necessarily think of Reagan intervening in these covert affairs. We think of Reagan in terms of talking with Gorbachev, or talking with Maggie Thatcher. And this overseeing of the covert operations is happening in the darkness, kind of behind the president with the involvement of someone like North or the CIA director, or maybe even George H.W. Bush at the time. Um, but so Reagan doesn't get involved as much directly with this flooding of Africa and Latin America and Central Asia with these mass amount of guns, or Reagan doesn't get involved with this vision of undermining other governments, right? He's the public face, not necessarily the person making those kind of shadier decisions behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So our next question is one that we've kind of already touched on, but I'll ask it anyways. Uh, and it comes from a History Respawn patron uh, named David Schroeder. Uh, he asks, uh, the mythos of Reagan as the great cold warrior is entrenched in the Western mythos, and especially with conservative America. But how accurate is the perception that Reagan, by means of outspending the Soviets, won the Cold War? Isn't it more accurate to say that Reagan only continued the spending path set by Jimmy Carter? Yeah, uh, change. There's a balance of change and continuity. Continuity here. Um, uh, I believe that there is a great deal of continuity uh, between between Carter and Reagan, uh, and uh, and military spending. If you look just at uh, at arms sales, uh, for example, uh, and take uh, uh, AWACS uh, as a as a specific example, um, Carter, the Carter administration is trying to sell AWACS uh, and get congressional approval to sell that uh, to Iran. Uh, in uh, in the late 1970s, before uh, before the revolution, uh, the Reagan administration successfully uh, sells the same program to Saudi Arabia. Uh, after afterwards, uh, if you look at the Carter Doctrine, um, uh, which declares uh, the Persian uh, the Persian Gulf uh, to be crucial to American national uh, national security, uh, and um, the creation of the Rapid Joint Deployment uh, uh, Force. Um, uh, and other uh, other aspects of late 70s uh, Carter foreign policy, uh, it seems as if Reagan, uh, you know, sort of picks picks it up uh, and builds uh, and builds on it. Uh, and it's interesting uh, because in the campaign he spends a lot of time attacking uh, attacking Carter, uh, but afterwards um, I, I think there's a lot of congruence between those policies for sure. That's it's a great question by the patron. And, and I'll add that sometimes I think we remember Reagan as this great Cold War because, I mean, yes, he was, but his rhetoric was often even stronger than his actual policies. Uh, things like the evil empire that he threw around went much further than um, what, what the United States was actually doing in the world. And more importantly, I mean, he actually seemed to be willing to negotiate with the Soviet Union from almost the first day he came into office. And one of the reasons he wasn't able to wasn't necessarily that his rhetoric was too strong. Even the Soviet Union kind of thought he was exaggerating for uh, domestic political purposes. He wasn't able to negotiate because, you know, the leaders of the Soviet Union kept dying on him, essentially. He never had a chance to build up a good relationship with, you know, an Anton Chernenko because he wasn't there long enough 
to, to build up a relationship. And so, you know, Reagan always kind of had that, that thing that we see at the end with, the, you know, talking with Gorbachev and then challenging him at the Berlin Wall to go a little bit further, right? He was always kind of playing both sides of that coin. And, and part of the thing is we just remember that rhetoric so much more at the beginning of the 1980s than we, we do some of it later. So this game promotes the notion that the greatest danger in the Cold War wasn't proxy wars overseas or for regimes falling to communism, but instead the threat of communist action within the United States. And I'm wondering, to what extent were these fears justified and to what extent were they based on any kind of historical reality? I, I don't think that they're justified at all. Um, I, I don't think it's based on historical reality uh, reality at all. Uh, I think when you have uh, these fears, um, uh, they're largely being uh, ginned up uh, and exploited uh, for domestic uh, for domestic political reasons. Um, I mean, you have eras uh, that your your listeners will know well of uh, of red scares uh, in U.S. Uh, in U.S. history, uh, and um, I I think that the the conclusion is that uh, in fact the ideology of anti communism. Uh, and uh, the limits that that put on political dialogue in the United States uh, is far more detrimental uh, to um, to the United States than the actual uh, threat of you know uh, some sort of communist uh, ideological uh, ideological invasion. I, I don't think to paraphrase Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer uh, from the early 1920s. I don't think the flames of uh, of communism are lapping at the church bells and the and the schoolyards uh, of, uh, of of America in any meaningful way. I'd add, so one of the, the ways I, I do this when I when I teach it to my students is I think there was that kind of Cold War hawkish fear of, of you know, a Soviet invasion or Soviet undermining the United States. But but if you go back and you look at the movie Red Dawn, which which is this famous, everybody kind of knows. As movie. I often do every year. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, it was my cousin's favorite movie when I was growing up. Um, but if you go back and look at that, that's about the invasion of the United States by a joint force of the Soviet Union and Cuba. But to get to the point where they have to invade, that beginning of the movie has to say essentially Europe fell, NATO's collapsed. I mean, all these fantastical things that were nowhere near the realm of the American security reality just to get to the point where there could be this Soviet invasion. And so that's how I kind of see it, right? This was the greatest fear these individuals had, but it was so far removed from the security reality at the time that it was really more about the mindset that they came to, to bear, like this is the threat the Soviet Union could pose in the far future, or it was just about the rhetoric they were pushing. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I would say is um, that that element of the game that I saw at the time seemed very much to be attached to the fears we have right now uh, of Russian meddling almost being cast back into history, because once again, these are our greatest fears and, and we're gonna project it into a way that into this fiction that we're talking about essentially to, to make it more interesting just kind of like red dawn did mm -hmm. and, and and there are always people who are willing to capitalize uh, on uh, on these fears uh, and the question historians ask uh, is are they doing this uh, for uh, sort of crass uh, political reasons or do they actually believe what they uh, what they are saying uh, and i don't think that those two things are mutually exclusive i think there's off, often an overlap uh, I mean, if you look at again the late 1970s in this uh, this world uh, that was created that uh, created the conditions for Reagan to have his uh, his stunning electoral electoral successes uh, in the 1980s, uh, you have to turn back uh, to sort of uh, detente uh, and um, this idea among many conservatives that detente had weakened the United States and, and given the Soviet Union uh, new opportunities uh, to sort of. Uh, uh, accelerate their moribund, uh, their moribund economy and their and their foreign and their foreign policy, uh, and you have you know groups like the Committee for uh, Clear and Present Danger, uh, or Team B uh, within the CIA uh, that are really talking about uh, this renewed this renewed Soviet uh, Soviet threat. And if we look at the Committee uh, on the Present uh, Danger, um, you know they're arguing uh, that uh, the United States is losing the Cold War. Um, uh, and given what's going on in the late 1970s uh, and the state of uh, the state of affairs within the United States, uh, um, you know, when someone like David Packard of uh, of the military industrial giant Hewlett Packard says uh, says this, a lot of people are going to believe it. 
Um, uh, so I do think that there's an aspect here, but I think that the idea that uh, it could come home to the shores of the United States uh, in, uh, in the form of Soviet mercenaries uh, is, is really, really far, really far fetched. Uh, but uh, you have the sort of militaristic, uh, militaristic view. One of my favorite cultural artifacts from the 1980s uh, is a short run comic book series called Reagan's Raiders. Uh, in which you have Ronald Reagan, uh, I believe um, George Bush, uh, uh, George uh, George Schultz, and maybe William Casey or Casper Weinberg, I can't remember, uh, in superhero spandex, uh, you know, uh, waging uh, waging victory for uh, for the American way, um, you know, very similar to Captain America uh, during World War II, um, uh, and I think that uh, that sort of attitude is, you know, much more an accurate portrayal of what the Cold War looks like at home uh, or what it could look like at home in the 19, in the 1980s. Wow. I had no idea. Reagan's Raiders, you said. Is this, uh, I mean, is this worth uh, picking up today or worth going back and looking at? Uh, any articles on this by historians, perhaps? I, I don't know. Joe, do you know if there are any articles on it? I haven't seen, I haven't I seen have anything. Not, I, I, I will tell you that I am actually working on an article about the, the security issues that feed their way into comics in the 1980s because you get a real revival mm. of um, interest in that. And among other things, the, the middle suicide squad incarnation in DC works for the government and among other things, infiltrates the Soviet Union uh, multiple times at the behest of the United States fighting this Cold War. I mean, there's a real Cold War revival in comics post kind of like 1960s, 1970s disillusionment with the military genre and comics and, and other things. And, and then it very much reaches this revival. And the number one example, I don't know, is, I mean, yes, I, I love the Reagan's Raiders thing, but I mean, G.I. Joe is very much yeah. um, that revival yeah. of the, the kind of militaristic, um, apparently laser shooting in the 1980s um, <laughs> version of, of the United States. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a huge diatribe, but I love it. It's fun. Awesome. Uh, you know, I would I would just add. Uh, we can talk about Nicaragua. We can talk about Angola. Um, you know, Joe's topic of study. We can talk about Afghanistan and uh, and covert aid. Uh, I think one of the uh, big effects of sort of um, uh, funding policing and militaries abroad uh, in the United States uh, is the militarization of policing uh, in in the United States. And I'm sure your readers are well aware of uh, of this. Of this genre, but uh, it seems like uh, one of the ways that professional historians are studying this uh, is to link together um, the evisceration of the welfare, welfare state, um, the war, uh, the war on drugs, uh, and sort of the paramilitarization of policing in the United States uh, as it relates uh, to aid uh, for policing uh, policing abroad. Uh, so I think that there are important ways uh, to connect the international and the domestic, uh, the domestic here. Um, that may exist outside of the call of uh, the call of duty imaginary. Yeah. So, um, so one thing I would say, and I kind of wrote it down for the last question, is, you know, we're we're kind of dealing with this exaggerated threat of the the Soviet Union and and saying, you know, that it didn't really have any any basis in reality. And I, I think to some extent that's true. But I think that that as Chris kind of said, um, you know, there was a real fear um, informing a lot of this, and I think this division of the Soviet Union as threat and the Soviet Union as antagonist, but maybe not quite as threatening, informed uh, a real political divide that shaped foreign policy and, and shaped politics. And, and so on the one hand, you have those Cold War hawks who see the USSR as this evil empire, and it needed to be confronted and defeated and rolled back and all those things. And then you have the, the kind of more liberal or more centrist wing of the Republican Party and, and a lot of Democrats who you know, they weren't fans of the Soviet Union, but they didn't see it as the same level of threat. And so we didn't need to be wasting our resources trying to contain Soviet communism when there are all these other things we could be doing in the world. And I think this division is very important because there is this real political divide. And I think one of the things that, that we celebrate Reagan for is that he was able to break with this kind of hawkish wing of the Republican Party when voices like Henry Kissinger were saying, you know, be distrustful of Gorbachev. He's the one who, who said, you know, no, this is somebody that, that I can work with, right? We move beyond these caricatures that were kind of set up in Red Dawn. And Reagan really helped, I, I think, 
legitimize Gorbachev as an actor that he could work with and the United States could embrace and the United States could get behind. And so it's, it's this vision of Reagan that's, that's rejecting this one set of advisors or this one reading of the Cold War and working with Gorbachev to be this partner in negotiations that I, I think is one of the reasons why we have this more positive image of him. But you can see how that, that Cold War hawkishness that's, that's present in some of this game or that's present in films like Red Dawn could have, you know, scuttled those negotiations just because we can't trust the Soviet Union, right? And so and that, that's one thing that I think is worth kind of remembering that, that role of individuals, but also how important and how real these political divides actually were. Right, I would, I would add to that, uh, that while we have political divides, you also have a pretty uh, steady uh, center uh, when it comes to certain topics, uh, including military spending. Uh, I, I do think that um, if you look back to Vietnam and think about the price tag there being around $170 million, uh, million dollars, uh, and uh, in order to avoid raising taxes, uh, decisions uh, by both the Johnson and Nixon administration uh, um, to borrow heavily uh, um, continue uh, into uh, the 1980s and 1990s and, uh, and beyond. Uh, and when we talk about government budgets, uh, I think it's important uh, to uh, remember defense spending is a huge part uh, of, the, of the government budget. And that's something that more and more historians are starting, uh, are starting to look at uh, is not necessarily the divisive political process, uh, but how, uh, how defense spending and military, uh, and military spending uh, is uh, consensus uh, within the United States in the period uh, um, that we're looking at and, and afterwards. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Chris, Joe, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of History Respawn and want to see more episodes, please visit us at historyrespawn.com. Once there, please consider supporting our work by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash historyrespawn. Until next time, goodbye.